In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 verse 31. And we're still dealing with the subject of divorce and that's because Jesus Christ brings it up in Matthew chapter 5 31. And we have to keep in mind the audience uh, Jesus Christ actually had an audience in this uh, message that he was giving, and Matthew recorded it. And so what he is saying here is actually there are a bunch of scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites listening to him. And under the Mosaic Law, uh, they had come to use what is called the divorce gimmick. And just about for any reason at that time, anyone could get a divorce. Just simply sign some papers, send it to the Levitical priest, and usually it would be approved immediately, especially if the divorce was initiated by the husband. And so a lot of those Pharisees who were holier than thou, and a lot of those Pharisees who were very self-righteous, had had divorces in which they had used the divorce gimmick. And they justified it saying, well, Moses gave us a letter of divorce. And so we can get divorced for any reason. And this comes out in a later chapter of Matthew. But the fact is, Jesus Christ had been uh, lambasting them thus far on the fact that they were sinners. And they had a hard time seeing that. But that's what they had to see first before they could come to realize that they needed a Savior, which would be Jesus Christ. So in verse 31, Jesus Christ makes it clear. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. And that is the way it was presented in the Mosaic Law, and that is correct. But then Jesus Christ amplifies on this to let them know that even though they followed the law according to the Mosaic Law, they were still sinners. And he goes on to say, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness, adultery, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. So we've been studying the doctrine of adultery for about two hours now. This will be the third hour. So I won't elaborate on that right now. It was elaborated on earlier. But now we will take a look at divorce in this age. How are we to handle divorce? And what, in, in which cases is divorce legitimate? And where is divorce not only legitimate, but you have a right of remarriage? All of this is listed in Scripture. Now, there are uh, three dispensations in which divorce is mentioned. It's mentioned during the dispensation of Israel. And here we actually have the divorce gimmick because uh, you could pretty much get divorced for any reason in the Old Testament. And we looked at a lot of the reasons that they used. Uh, one of the reasons was if the uh, woman uh, wore her hair down in public. Now, one, one of the men may make an issue out of that. Or if the woman simply flirted with another man, they would say, you have shamed me, I divorce you. And all of that was a part of the divorce gimmick. Now, under the concept of the divorce gimmick, uh, well, the victim of the divorce gimmick has the right of remarriage and the right of divorce. For example, uh, someone may say, uh, well, let's go with the wife. The wife says to the husband, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. Well, that's not a legitimate reason for divorce, but it's a divorce gimmick. Behind that is her desire for another man, probably, or something else. So she just simply says, I want a divorce, and by the law under the United States of America, she can get one. And under that, when she gets the divorce, she will be the one committing adultery when she remarries or when she actually goes and fornicates after the marriage is dissolved. So the victim of this divorce gimmick is the one who actually gets the legitimate right of divorce and the legitimate right of remarriage. The guilty party doesn't have that right. 
but they'll do it anyway. So what they do when they go out after they tell their first husband, I don't love you anymore. And behind it all is they found someone else. And then when they get the divorce and they go with this other man, when they marry him, well, not only has she committed adultery, but so has the other man. And that will dissolve the first marriage. So that will be one act of committing adultery. And there is a solution to that if you're a believer, and that is the rebound technique in which if you are guilty of doing such a thing, you can still get with the spiritual life by God's grace. But it will not go unpunished. And you will be punished severely for using the divorce gimmick. And a part of this, we'll see how all of this destroys a society. The same thing was happen happening during the days Christ was on the earth. And shortly thereafter, Israel went under the fifth cycle of discipline. Then in the dispensation of the hypostatic union, it is brought out that adultery is a reason for legitimate divorce and remarriage. Adultery. And that's where our Lord says this in Matthew chapter 5, 31. Adultery is a legitimate reason for divorce and remarriage. The third reason is desertion. That is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 15. And, uh, and well, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 12, and we'll take a look at this desertion. But in the dispensation of the church, desertion is added as a reason for divorce and remarriage, legitimate divorce and remarriage. Now, under our laws, we can get divorced and remarried uh, just uh, anyone we want to, anytime we want to. But under God's law, this is how we should function. And this is in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 that deals with desertion. If any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, do not divorce her. So it starts out telling you, look, if you've made the mistake to marry an unbeliever, don't use that as an excuse to jump out of the marriage. Stick with that marriage if the unbeliever wants to stay with you. Now, there are different cases in which you could end up being married to an unbeliever. You could both start out as unbelievers, and then one of you believe in Christ. That doesn't give you a right to leave that marriage, and we'll study several reasons why. A marriage between a believer and an unbeliever is classified as a mixed marriage. Now, oftentimes we will look at a, a black man with a white woman or a white or a black woman with a white man and call that a mixed marriage. Well, the Bible looks at it differently. A mixed marriage is actually a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever. And that means you are unequally yoked. Race is not even an issue, uh, never an issue given in the New Testament as being part of a, a prere prerequisite, prerequisite for marriage. If it were, is uh, well, we're a bunch of, uh, what do you call them, mutts. Uh, the people of the United States were mutts. And my dad was telling me he was, uh, one of my cousins was doing a family tree. And there are Welch and there are Indians. And there are all different types of people in his side of the family tree. And then there's probably even some Asians uh, on the side of my mother. So really, if you're a member of the United States of America, that's just hypothetical. I think there is because some of her people look Asian. It's not proven, but I think that's why I'm so short. But <laughs> what happens is if you're a member of the United States of America, you're not really belonging to one race. Probably all of you or some of you probably have some Indian in you, all different types of races that you probably aren't even aware of. And, uh, and in fact, that's probably why Americans are the uh, most beautiful of people because we have such a rich mixture in our blood. Now, if you go to Europe, they look, white. I mean, they are very white. Go to England, any of those uh, parts in Europe, there's really been not much mixture, so they uh, look white. So race is never an issue with marriage. Uh, but what is an issue is, has that person believed in Christ? So the, again, as a point of principle, the Bible has no pro prohibition about uh, uh, cross-racial marriages. And don't get involved in judging people because they uh, marry someone who looks different than them or has a different color. That's not part of Scripture. It's part of our culture to razz them. But it's not part of Scripture, and we shouldn't get involved in that. 
So there, there are reasons why mixed marriage or an unequally yoked marriage occurs. First of all, the believer could be ignorant about the prohibition. They may never have read 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, and they uh, may have never learned these doctrines, so they ignorantly jump into a marriage with an unbeliever. That's one reason. The second reason is the believer could know better, but they have a hard head, and their libido is stronger than the Word of God that they know. So they say, I love this person anyway, God. I'm going to marry them. And so they get a, a stiff neck and do it anyway, and so they will be punished. And then the third reason is when the, the marriage, of course, occurs between two unbelievers, and then one of the spouse becomes a Christian. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, 13 through 14, Furthermore, a woman has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her. Do not divorce your husband, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through the wife, now, this does not mean he's saved through the wife. Just because you marry an unbeliever doesn't mean because you're a believer and he's an unbeliever, you've gotten married, now he's sanctified to God. No, it means the marriage is set apart to God. That's all that means. Uh, the marriage, because one of you is a believer, that marriage is sanctified, set apart to God, which also means you really have no reason to get out of that marriage except for desertion, adultery, or uh, the other one, of uh, the divorce gimmick. So sanctified or holy means set apart unto God. It does not mean salvation here at all. It wouldn't even make sense. Rather, it means a separation unto God. So these words are used as a reminder to us that the, the believer just can't divorce the person because suddenly they hear the doctrine and they say, wow, I'm a believer. I shouldn't be married to this unbeliever as per another verse we'll look at. So I'm jumping out of the marriage. But the Apostle Paul makes it clear, you can't do that. As long as they're willing to stay with you, you must stay with them. So again, the three, well, in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, this is the exception. Yet if the unbelieving spouse deserts, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such a case. So in this case, if the unbeliever deserts the believer, then that is a legitimate basis for divorce, and the innocent partner, that would be the believer who has just been left, has the right of remarriage. So desertion is a reason. And when an unbeliever deserts or divorces a believer, the believer definitely has the right of remarriage. And hopefully this time they'll have enough sense to marry a believer. And hopefully they'll have enough wisdom by this time to marry a believer who's growing in grace and in knowledge. So the principle of staying in this status quo is restated in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 16 through 17. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband or not? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Therefore, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him, the place to which God called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. So they must stay together if, if one of them doesn't desert and if one of them wants to stay in the marriage. There's no reason for divorce in that case. So, an so a believer doesn't have an excuse. Uh, usually they get in the marriage and say, oops, I've made a mistake, and they use this as an excuse to get out. It cannot. It is used, but it should not be used as an excuse. And there are reasons for that. The first reason, point one, the reason why you just can't run off and leave the unbeliever with whom you are married. It, there's a possibility of winning the unsaved spouse to the Lord. That's the first and most important reason. There's a possibility, so long as you are married, that through your lifestyle and, and through them seeing you, and maybe one day they will believe in Christ. So the possibility of winning the unsaved spouse to the Lord. The second reason. This is the principle of accepting responsibility for your own decisions, whether they're good or bad. And that's one of the ways to really gauge if you've grown up in life. Do you take responsibility for your actions? Or every time you mess up, do you try to pass the blame on to someone else? Are you always functioning under self-justification? I had a right to do it. They were an unbeliever and we were incompatible. That's self-justification. You do not have a right to do it. <clears throat> so you must take the responsibility for your own actions, good or bad. That's point two. 
Point three is a very basic principle, one that you've probably all learned growing up. The principle that two wrongs do not make a right. Uh, your brother bops you on the head and you bop him back. Well, two wrongs don't make a right. And so, uh, that is the principle, and this is a very basic one. And to jump out of the marriage because you wrongly got into the marriage, it doesn't make it right to get out of it. That's two wrongs, and it doesn't make it right. And then we have uh, point four, the principle of providing a stabilized environment for the rearing of children. A lot of times, the unbeliever and the believer will have children. Well, they need to have a stable environment. And it would be pretty selfish for you just to jump out of it because of your incompatibility. You should have known that going into it. And so you just jump right out of it, and it becomes a destabilizer for family. And the fourth reason, when the, or the fifth reason, when there is a destabilization of family, especially when it's widespread, there's a destabilization of culture and the country. That is very self-evident today in all the garbage that's going around in our culture. It's because of the breakdown of the family. And no nation has ever survived the breakdown of the family. And don't think for one minute this nation is any different. The Roman Empire in its later stages, at first in the beginning of the Republic, only the husband could offer divorce and it was rare. But in the later part of the empire, both the husband and wife could, give, could uh, be, be given a divorce at any time for whatever reason, and the family fell apart. And not long after that, Rome fell apart. It is just a constant principle of history. And unless people wake up to the word of God in this country, it will destroy us. It will. It may, you may say, well, it seems all right now. I just give it 20 years. It will destroy this country. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in 10 years, but if there's not a turnaround, or at least one more generation would just about wipe, it, wipe us out because then we'd be moving into the fourth generation curse. So believers often try to justify the divorce in a mixed marriage on the basis of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. So let's say the uh, person hasn't read 1 Corinthians, but their pastor has taught them 2 Corinthians 6.14. You can turn there if you wish. 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness with lawlessness? And rem remember that righteousness is not a, a self-righteousness. We are imputed the righteousness of God at the moment of salvation. But the lawlessness, the unbeliever, is always lawless, always under the sin nature. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? The believer is under the concept of light. The unbeliever is always under the concept of darkness. There's really no fellowship there. So they would read this verse and they would say, Oh no, I am bound together. I'm getting out of the marriage. Well, you must know more about Scripture and follow what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So this is usually just an excuse. It's an excuse of either the man or the woman who is bored. They got married too young or they got married not having any sense, so they get bored in the marriage. And so they, and be boredom means that there's some type of failure in your spiritual life. None of you uh, should be suffering from boredom. And when you suffer from boredom, your thinking's not in the right place. Now it takes spiritual growth, of course, if you're in spiritual childhood or spiritual adolescence, especially spiritual childhood, you're going to have moments of boredom. But once you start to fill your soul with the thinking of Christ, it's impossible to be bored with the thinking of Christ. And so bored people really don't know how to entertain themselves. And usually people like this always have to be on the phone with somebody. Nothing wrong with that. Don't take it to the extremes. But they always have to be around people. They always have to be involved in something. And if they ever find themselves sitting at home on a couch alone with no television or anything else, they don't know how to entertain themselves. They don't know how to pick up a book and read it and just simply entertain themselves. So bored people are really losers in life. And this applies for both believer and unbeliever. Because uh, it's very simple, ladies, to get the attention of your husband. If you're bored and you want the attention of your husband and you're trying to uh, down your, downgrade your husband because uh, he doesn't fulfill you in some way, well, maybe you're the one not using enough imagination and allurement. It's very easy, ladies, for you to allure your husband or to entertain your husband. 
and you might and it just just takes a little bit of imagination so there's no need for boredom to be an excuse to get out of marriage and that's usually the way it comes up i'm bored i'm uh, divorcing the unbeliever and not because they're unbelievers just because you're bored usually it becomes part of a divorce gimmick so we must have a principle and that is that god deals with marriage as a whole because marriage is a collective divine institution and remember we studied in part a very short study on the corporate testimony so marriage has a a lot more implications today than it did even in the old testament so he deals with it as a collective divine institution and if your marriage succeeds both of you go the full route in your spiritual life you become part of a wonderful testimony and it is something that's rare but something that does happen in every generation God also deals with the family as a collective unit and you say well how does he do that well I tell you if there's one person in your family who has gone to spiritual maturity uh, you will have blessing by association whether it be money or wealth or something else there will be some type of blessing by association when one of those uh, one of the members of the family goes to spiritual maturity and if your whole family goes there well that's rare but it's a wonderful thing if that can occur so it does become a source of blessing to the whole family because God deals with the family as a unit now there's some guy in Connecticut I don't know I know his name I'm not going to give it to you because I don't want you to look him up and there's some guy either in Connecticut or Massachusetts I was told this I didn't hear it firsthand who taught that the uh, five cycles of discipline do not apply to this age well, that's ridiculous, because that would mean that God does not deal with uh, his institutions as units. Volition is a unit, divine institution number one. Marriage is a unit, divine institution number two. Family is a unit, and he created them and deals with them as units. Nationalism is a unit. He deals with countries as a unit. The idiot's trying to, I don't know what he's doing. A lot of times they like to uh, come up with their own things to see, to, just to see if they can be more brilliant than one of the most brilliant men since the Apostle Paul, the arrogant fools. This is not the way it works. It's very simple. The nations are a unit too. And if, a, if there is a pivot of mature believers in a client nation, that client nation is blessed. Just open your eyes. The guy, the guy must be blind. He can't look around and see that he's living in the greatest country on earth and there's a reason for it. It's not just happening. Some people burn me up. Okay, so uh, we need to, we'll move from this uh, divorce thing for a moment because uh, let's say you're here single today and you're wondering uh, what you should look for in a partner. Now, of course, on Sunday, I gave you that compatibility checklist. It's not foolproof, of course. Nothing is foolproof in life. But it would, give, it would uh, increase your odds, as it were, if you uh, were to follow that checklist. And if more people did that, we wouldn't have a 50 or 60% divorce rate. But let's say you're dating someone. For those of us who are already married, it's too late. But for uh, those of you who have the uh, privilege to date, not necessarily a privilege, I, I, I do not envy you at all. It's a terrible time to date anyone. But if you ever have the opportunity to date, uh, remember to avoid uh, these types of people. And you have to avoid, definitely, avoid the uh, psychotic or the neurotic. And you might, know, not, might not know the symptoms of that, but it's important to know how to evaluate people so that you're not so naive, so that you're not uh, just uh, jumping into something because they're cute or because they're very beautiful and uh, you don't just jump into marriage on superficial things otherwise you'll end up with someone who might have problems with their psyche have neurosis or something else and it's widespread and uh, I'm going to give you some of the listings that you can uh, well it'll be a red flag for you when you're dating and uh, if you have some of these symptoms uh, just remember all of us at some point uh, split from reality all of us have the capability and ability and all of us have been uh, for at least a split moment uh, neurotic or psychotic it's just part of the uh, human condition and our old sin nature but if this is a consistent characteristic 
This is what you should avoid. And if you say, "Uh uh-oh, I got that characteristic. I need to go to the doctor. I'm crazy. Don't just jump. Don't jump the gun. Usually it's a combination of a lot of these symptoms. But first of all, uh, watch out for mood disorders. One minute they're very happy and they love you. The next minute they hate you. Mood disorders. And if you uh, hook up with someone with a mood disorder, you too have the possibility to go nuts. Because remember, when you're married as a unit, Usually when the spouse is happy, uh, you're going to have a tendency to want to be happy too. And when the spouse is mad, uh, you're going to react to that unless you have a lot of doctrine. But for most people who don't, it's going to mean disaster because she'll be unhappy, you'll be unhappy. And then uh, she'll be happy and you'll feel good. And so your emotions start to take that same swing and you have a danger of following in their footsteps and ruining any chance of having a spiritual life. So mood disorders... Now, a next one is uh, manic speech. Now, manic speech is loud, rapid, and often difficult to interpret. Now, uh, I guess it was like on that uh, show that y'all had me watch, Napoleon Dynamite. That uh, one, the one guy who was uh, sitting on the computer, the guy that was always at the computer looking, uh, talking to babes or whatever, he, he, he seemed to be kind of manic and always with a rapid speech. But once he got with that woman, he chilled out. But anyway, that would be something to avoid. Not that any of you would be attracted to somebody like that. He was kind of a weirdo-looking fellow. But manic speech is loud, rapid, and difficult to interpret. The third thing is hyperactivity. This doesn't mean uh, having ambition. We're talking about a hyperactivity where there's just no ability to relax whatsoever. Hyperactivity. Uh, just uh, well, it can. It is. It has been elaborated on nowadays by different uh, terms such as ADD, ADHD, and all of that. They are truly disorders. It's not. It's not really made up. Some people have these disorders, and some of it's physiological. Most of it has to do with their decisions in life. But f- as for children, uh, some children get ADD, ADHD. And a lot of it must be physiological, and it might be environmental too in how they're raised. But not all, it, not in all cases. There's always exceptions. Now there's rapid shifts from anger to depression. Somebody's very angry one moment, then depressed and uh, sullen, and they don't want to talk or any of that. And this uh, depression, this severe depression, is usually expressed by uh, tear, tearful periods, long tearful periods, and also suicide, suicidal threats. That would be uh, something to avoid definitely. If you're dating a girl who is always crying and talking about suicide, I don't care how beautiful she is, uh, you'll be miserable with someone like that. Uh, Another thing to watch out for is uh, distractibility, and usually this uh, results in uh, rapid changes in speech or activity as a result of responding to various uh, external stimuli, such as uh, background noise. Uh, They would be more interested in listening to the air condition rattle than listening to the Word of God. They're distracted by that, or just easily distracted by a background noise, uh, distracted by signs or pictures on a wall. And that's something to avoid because you'll have no a rapport with someone like that. But this one is pretty obvious to tell. Also avoid a, someone who has a inflated human self-esteem, also known as arrogance. Human, uh, inflated human self-esteem. And this is based on an uncritical uh, self-confidence. Uh, they just, uh, and oftentimes it results in delusion. And uh One of the guys who was pretty delusional in Napoleon Dynamite, that is a good movie for any uh, student of psychology. The one delusional guy was the one who was always throwing the football and uh, talking about how great he could have been. I would have been so great if I could just go back to 1980. Well, he was delusional. He was a fruitcake. So avoid inflated human uh, self-esteem. And uh, no, uh, no criticism of self. And, and then usually that's followed by a sense of worthlessness and feelings of inadequacy. You go from being all uh, pompous and straightforward and uh, going out to conquer the world. And then when uh, things don't work out right, you have feelings of inadequacy. Avoid those type of people. Definitely avoid people who have a guilty conscience. 
they have a guilty conscience, uh, well, your love life will be terrible because it, it usually it's related to illicit sexual activity where people really become guilty. Also, other reasons for guilt, but that's usually the main one. And uh, your, your sex life will be terrible with any person who has a, a guilt complex. Avoid that. And remember, sex life is for marriage only, so don't think, don't try it out first. It's for marriage only. So what the single person should definitely be aware of in a mate is feelings of inadequacy. Someone who is always self-deprecating himself or someone who has a very low self-esteem and they have feelings of inadequacy, also known as an inferiority complex. These people are difficult to live with. The second is a lack of concentration or an ability to think clearly. If, if no matter how beautiful that gal is or handsome that man is, if he can't think clearly or concentrate on you, you will get bored in a New York minute. And then a uh, third thing to watch out for is social withdrawal. Social withdrawal. And usually people with social withdrawal, when you get to know them, uh, they will become very possessive of you and uh, they will limit your social life, or try to, uh, run from those type of people. Uh, you have the freedom to have a social life, and the reason why they try to limit you is because they don't have one. They feel too inadequate to have one. So they have a social withdrawal or a lack of interest in pleasurable activities, uh, such as you might enjoy bowling or you might enjoy going to a movie and they like to be a hermit. Avoid that. You will uh, get bored with them. You may not be bored in life, but you'll definitely uh, get bored with them. The fourth thing to uh, look for is irritability. Are they very irritable? And definitely avoid those. Now, there's categories of uh, neurosis that is currently recognized by psychology. It was recognized by the Word of God, by the way, far before psychology uh, discovered these things. And Freud thought he was a genius, but the Apostle Paul knew all about this. And even James, even though he didn't go the full length of the spiritual life, even he knew that the psychosis could be related to a lack of a spiritual fervor, a lack of growing in grace and in knowledge. So we have phobic neurosis. That's irrational fear of a specific object or a situation or an irrational fear of circumstances. And I remember I had a fr friend one time, uh, we went into the only skyscraper they have in Spartanburg. It's not really a skyscraper. It's 17 stories. I guess it classifies. And uh, I was going to take him to the top of the skyscraper and uh, show him the view it has up there. It's a pretty neat view. And, well, uh, we had to go in the elevator. And he, he just started freaking out. He had a phobia of elevators. I'd never seen anything like that. When I finally got him on it, and he was about crawling on the floor. Well, it'd be hard to have a relationship and have any fun with somebody who's scared of everything. When he finally got up there, he was all right. But then, I guess he was scared of heights. That's part of a phobia. But he looked—he seemed to be more scared of the elevator, which is strange. And anyway, there is the a neurotic personality. Neurotic people are uh, suspicious. We all uh, know the, these types of people. Usually they're recluses, and uh, sometimes it's happened to them because of something outside of their free will. Maybe they had some accident that destroyed a part of their brain or something else occurred. But in a lot of cases, it's just brought on by their own wrong decisions in life. And remember, the more wrong decisions that you make in life, you limit the number of decisions you can make. So if you've constantly made wrong decisions for 27, 28 years, usually it results in psychosis. That's why, for the most part, most people who go psychotic, it does not come out until they're in their mid or late 20s. And then it starts to show their, uh, their personality really begins to change because of the number of bad decisions they've made limits the number of decisions they can make in the future, so they go nuts. They tend to avoid blame when they're actually at fault. And that's what a lot of people do. And when you do that, you're on the road toward psychosis. They are secretive. They are devious. They are scheming. They are very tense type of people. They don't really have a true sense of humor. Or they might la laugh out loud at nothing, but they really don't have a true sense of humor in which uh, they can carry on normal conversations. They have a lack of sentimental or tender feelings. They don't have that normal compassion that most of us have. They are hostile. They are stubborn. They become defensive. 
they have an inordinate feeling of fear, always worried uh, something's about, uh, something's going to occur with them, and usually always worried that the world is against them. I can't tell you how many times I heard that when I would go on break at the mental health center. The whole world is against me. About all of them have that same uh, type of line. Well, maybe it's not the whole world. Maybe it's you who's a little off in the head, but they never see that. And you can't make them see that. The only thing they can do for those people is give them medicine, and it seems to help somewhat, uh, but they still have problems. The neurotic person shows an excessive need to be self-sufficient to the point of egocentricity and has an exaggerated sense of their own uh, self-importance. And so uh, that's definitely part of it. Uh, they just uh, think of themselves as being uh, so great and self-sufficient. And really it gets to the point, it's kind of like uh, what uh, Benjamin Franklin said. He might have had a problem with this type of uh, self-exaggeration, even though he was great in, uh, where in his field of work, politics and all. But uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin said that uh, God only helps those who help themselves. That's egocentricity. And that might have been part of him moving toward a neurosis. He, it wasn't documented that he ever went nuts. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying he would have had a tendency to be egocentric. He might have just had that one element of it and didn't go far in the other elements. But to say uh, that uh, uh, God doesn't help the helpless, that means he didn't understand grace. And it means he didn't understand that he was helpless. He thought so much of himself that he was self-sustaining. Well, he didn't even take another breath without God. And he was helpless. But since he was such a workaholic, and since he had limited himself to four hours of sleep a night, and he could uh, stay up and he despised sleep because he had all that hyperactivity that we discussed before, and he just was on the go all the time, and because of that he did achieve a lot in life. And therefore, he became er very arrogant one day and wrote in his almanac, God helps those who help themselves. That's fallacious. God always helps the helpless. And who's helpless? All of us. So, the neurotic person avoids participation in group activities unless he or she can dominate. The neurotic person avoids participation in group activities unless he or she can dominate. We've all run into personalities like that that if they're not talking in the conversation, there's no conversation. And they don't listen to you, they're just constantly talking about themselves to you, and you can't get a word in edgewise. This is, a, this is leaning toward the neurotic type personality. And many of the characteristics of the neurotic a person are merely a function of the old sin nature. And it's correctable through spiritual growth. That is, if you haven't let it go too far. If you've let it go too far, it's correct, cor correctable with medicine along with spiritual growth because some people uh, without their medicine are so far broken, broken from reality, they can never, they could never listen to what I'm saying and pick up on it. They're too busy worrying about the person breaking in their back door while I'm teaching. They see, impossible to uh, comprehend it, and it's sad if they are, uh, but a lot of times medicine can correct that, and then when they are under the influence of their medicine, they can sit down and comprehend, and then move on in their spiritual life, all of which is a grace provision that God knew about in eternity past. So therefore, the point is, Never just look at physical attraction only. It won't carry you. If you uh, marry a beautiful woman who is nuts, uh, you will grow to despise her no matter how beautiful she is. And if uh, the woman marries a man who is neurotic and possessive and has uh, no desire for pleasure or social life, well, you will be bored out of your mind. And it's all part of a, a mental disorder that might, might have been thrust upon them through their environment of being brought up under guilt. And if parents ever bring their children up under the concept of guilt, uh, you're pushing them away from you and pushing them toward a, having some of these hang-ups in life. And you will have these hang-ups growing up in the wrong type of environment. And uh, all of it can be overcome by doctrine, and it's not a hopeless situation. So uh, the point of that is avoid the crazy. Now, uh, <laughs> principles of grace. There are principles of grace that we can apply to divorce. Principles of grace that we can apply to divorce. And just because someone gets a divorce 
doesn't mean they're the worst stinker on the face of the earth. Remember, in their case, it may have been completely legitimate and they could legitimately get remarried, and they've committed no sins whatsoever. Yet the self-righteous hypocritical will always look down their noses and say, ooh, that person got a divorce. Divorce is, is not sin in certain cases, and, uh, and the self-righteous person is committing the worst of sins by uh, thinking they're so high and mighty. And grace applies to divorce and adultery, just as it applies to every other sin in life. So grace is the policy of God, we know that, in which God is free to do for mankind many wonderful things without compromising his divine essence. God is able, able to impute to us perfect righteousness without comprom compromising excuse me, his divine essence. So any member of a congregation has the, has the right to remain in a congregation and grow in grace, that is, unless they become a chronic gossips and maligners and they disturb the congregation, because we're all products of grace. And all of us have sinned in different ways. And uh, people come up with uh, respectable sins. The respectable sins in our society would be gossip. Uh, people can gossip about anyone, and it's accepted. And it's not really uh, frowned on. And nobody gossips about somebody for gossiping unless they're the ones being gossiped about. So it's, not, it's a respectable sin according to culture and society. But according to God, it's gross, far worse than adultery. And it's hard for us in our culture to understand that. We would be very quick to judge someone who has committed adultery, but not so quick to judge a gossip. But God judges the gossip more harshly. That's not saying divorce does not have punishment related to it or that is illegitimate divorce and also uh, have committing adultery. There's a lot, a lot of punishment in that, most of which is self-induced because you're going to lose a family and you're going to put yourself through a lot of soul torment. And you're doing it mostly to yourself. And if you're the one in the wrong, God will lay on a little harder. That is, if the other uh, half doesn't go wild and they get into strife and one side is constantly gossiping about the other side, that's destructive. You must leave it all in the Lord's hands, even though it is a very tragic, tragic situation. Grace is free, unmerited love and favor from God. And we cannot earn or deserve grace. We can't earn or deserve anything that God has given to us. All things that are received from God are a gift, of course. Grace is a manifestation of the power, the mercy, the efficacy, the compassion of God. So God has despised our sins, whether they be mental attitude sins or overt sins, whether they be gossip or divorce. God despised all of our sins in eternity past. And Jesus Christ on the cross despised all of our sins when they were being imputed to him and judged. So we've never earned or deserved all the things that God has given to us at salvation. 39 irrevocable things plus one. And in grace he has given to us the same privilege and the same opportunity to execute God's plan. And God does not discriminate against certain types of sins. Because someone's committed adultery and it ended up in divorce now they can still grow in the spiritual life. And while you're busy gossiping, maligning, and judging, you turn out to be a loser. And then you get to heaven, and you see that person you talked about your whole life because they committed adultery, and you see them with all of that honor of receiving all of those rewards, and you have nothing. Well, God is not really partial when it comes to the spiritual life. Remember David, a man after God's own heart, committed not only adultery, but murder. You see, when uh, David sinned, he liked the overt sins, and he apparently went all out. And when he did, he received punishment that was all out, too. So it's, it's, doesn't, it's not something to say, ooh, I can do the same. No, uh, David, if he had to take it back, definitely would have, instead of going through all of that punishment that he went through, all the way up until he was an old man, and then finally the punishment was removed, and he died uh, a very wonderful death with... Uh, a lot of virgins laying around him. And that's how he died, all of which was in grace. So uh, what we have to understand is that we've been given so many phenomenal things in our spiritual life that not even adultery can ruin it. 
and you say, well, I got divorced and it wasn't a legitimate divorce. And then I married someone else and in the process of doing so, not only did I commit adultery, but I committed adultery against the person I'm married to, which means you caused them as well to commit adultery. Now, uh, someone come up once and said adulterous marriage. Well, uh, it's consummated in adultery, then it's dissolved, and you can be married, and don't jump out of the marriage and jump out of the frying pan into the fire. It really can't be described as an adulterous marriage because once they consummate the marriage through sex, the former marriage bonds are destroyed. Remember, adultery can destroy the marriage bonds. It's legitimate to say so. And if someone commits adultery on you and you make the choice to divorce them, they, they, they need to be dead to you. You must remember that part. They need to be just as if they were dead because remember, death gives you the right of remarriage. And adultery, when they do so and you say, all right, I can't handle that, I'm getting a divorce. Well, they better be dead to you. And when you have those feelings come back and those good memories come back, which will often occur, especially if you're crying over your beer in a bar, don't go running back to, the, to that person. They're dead. Forget about it. Move on. God has something better for you. So the conclusion is, if you have done so, you can simply rebound. If you've done that, got uh, divorced, ir using a divorce gimmick illegitimately, and just used a divorce gimmick to get divorced, and then you got remarried and you say, oops, I uh, committed adultery by doing so. Uh, well, both of you in the marriage, the new marriage, can rebound and get mi moving with the spiritual life. And who knows, maybe both of you will have a wonderful marriage. It's happened. And uh, so, if you didn't know it or not, usually uh, second marriages have a higher divorce rate than first marriages. Uh, but that can be corrected, and the reason is because of what I've been telling you. But that can be corrected by post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And sometimes your second marriage could be the best ever. And a lot of times, and, and the way it goes in our culture... Uh, they, somebody, if they really want to grow in grace and in knowledge, and my pastor has known some, as many people as he's known, who were divorced five and six times and then finally woke up to the Word of God and said, what in the world am I doing? And then they got with uh, the Word of God and, and they remarried again and everything turned out all right. But I would personally avoid uh, marrying someone who had been married five or six times. There's something wrong there. But you see, the spiritual life can solve anything. And it has been said by the legalists that the bird with a broken wing uh, can never fly again. Well, I'm here to tell you that the bird with the broken wing can fly ever higher. And that's grace. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we've noted. And may they be a source of blessing and challenge in our life. And we pray for our president during these sticky times of history uh, that you will give him good, uh, helpful advice and wisdom in dealing with this world war. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.